let's move on to a, a, a new argument. Okay. okay. So um, the the moral argument is one of the arguments for for me that I've I've got a sort of love hate relationship okay. with. Yeah. Um, I, I love the fact that the the second premise. I mean, I think that that's just completely obvious, and that was that was brought home to me uh, actually after having a, a child. Yeah. And so you know, once you reflect on uh, the sort of moral responsibilities that you have toward mm. this child and what other people have toward this child, right. um, it, it just becomes completely obvious, I think, that right. uh, moral realism is true or, mm-hmm. or the, the, the idea that there are these moral facts uh, mm-hmm. and some of them are true. And so um, in that sense, I love the argument. But on the other side of it, I'm, I'm just sort of still working through myself mm-hmm. uh, the, the other side of it, which is to say that, you know, if God exists, um, or if God does not exist, rather, then these moral values, these, these moral duties would not exist. Yeah. Right, and so that's the that's the uh, the part of the argument that I'm sort of still working through. I've I've got some some ideas, some grasp of it, but uh, let's just work through your version of the argument. You sure. said that your yours is a little bit more on the abductive side. Yeah, that's so, right. so yeah, go ahead and just give us the uh, the basic structure of the argument, and then we'll just work through it. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, Baggett and, and Walls, uh, Walls being again another colleague here at HBU, uh, have an abductive. Uh, they sort of view the more arguments through abductive lenses, and that, that's that's what I, I, I find most satisfying. I think it gets a, a away from some of the um, problems that a deductive argument, say used by William Lane Craig, uh, might encounter. Um, so let's explain real quick what, um, one possible way to view uh, abductive reasoning, at least the categories that one would consider when one is uh, doing, say, inference the best explanation. And uh, you would look for explanatory scope. So can the, th- th- when you're looking at two different theories and they're trying to see which one explains the data better, um, what, what theory, can, can, can both theories explain all the data, right? Not only that, but can they explain it well? Uh, you know, are you left sort of satisfied after you hear the, the, the explanation given? Um, there's also something to look at. You look at, uh, at plausibility. Plausibility is in reference to is um, uh, this theory compatible with other fields of inquiry? So is it plausible given the fields of psychology or biology or evolution or um, which is some field within biology, but um, sociology, etc.? Is it plausible given these, these other fields of inquiry? And uh, uh, then you, you also look for ad hocness. You know, is it, is it, is it uh, the theory overtly ad hoc, right? You, and ad hoc is just like it, it, it's just something you completely just made up. It's, 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 it's sort of, it's sort of you postulate something sort of after the fact. You know, it gets critiqued, and you're like, oh, I'm going to explain this critique by, and you sort of postulate something in a uh, clearly after the fact sort of way. Um, and then, uh, if all things are equal, you look for simplicity, which theory best explains, uh, or which theory is simpler given given uh, that they're both roughly uh, have the same sort of explanatory ability. And so just to stop you there, so yeah. with this abductive approach, is there one sort of criteria that you're most interested in or most worried that, you know, this has got to be fulfilled over this one or this one takes priority or is it just sort of all, of them, all of them? All of them sort of take priority except simplicity, I, 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 for, 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 uh, I, at least as, as I understand it. Um, uh, all of them are quite important. Uh, and then simplicity, you don't look at simplicity until the very end. And that's if both the theories have the same roughly, you know, sort of explanatory um, Power. I mean, in, in some sense. I mean, obviously, the theory can't explain anything whatsoever, or bare, you know, hardly explains anything at all. But it's a bit more ad hoc, or something like that. I mean, you're going to give preference to uh, to the former. But uh, yeah, I mean, roughly, uh, all things considered, uh, you all, all these categories are quite important. And, and at last, you look at you look at simplicity. Uh, so uh, now, if if we can sort of apply this way of reasoning to um, our, our moral phenomenology, that is to say, our moral experience. Uh, you mentioned having a, a child, and then all of a sudden, I mean, it, you think about, like, it, it seems obvious that you have a moral duty, that you can't just all of a sudden, like, leave your baby uh, in its crib and just walk out of the room, just ne- never to see it again. That, 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 that would be completely morally... Uh, uh, abhorrent. Uh, abhorrent, yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, morally abhorrent to do so. You're failing to keep duties that you clearly have. You you you're completely acting immoral in the situation. Um, leave your baby to die, never to see it again. Abandoning all your responsibilities just because you're tired or something like that. 
Uh, you can think of other situations that also sort of bring out the same sort of um, moral phenomenology. Uh, think about ISIS, right? Uh, I know there was a, a picture on Facebook being passed uh, along through memes, which, you know, I don't know if it was completely uh, depicting an accurate scene or something like that, but... Uh, well, memes well, are the only true way to floss That's it, That's correct, it? yes, yes. Um, but uh, let's, let's say it was. There was a picture of an Islamist, uh, and I'm using Islamism, Islamist as a word to, um, uh, to delineate between radical Islam and Islam, so I have in mind radical Islam, had a picture of a, a radical uh, Muslim uh, putting like a, an auto, automatic weapon in, in front of a, a young child's face. I mean, the child was probably one and a half or two or something like that. And just sort of old enough to realize, I'm in danger. And sort of the, the child was looking like, please help me, mommy. Right? That was the sort of... Um, that was the sort of feeling you got from the picture. And the picture was quite powerful. It just sort of moved you like, that's not right. They should not be doing that. Uh, you, you look at... Uh, uh, I always tell my, my ethics students, uh, I always try to think of the worst possible scenario you can imagine, right? Um, so uh, whenever someone says, yeah, I think, you know, morals are relative, right? And then it's like, okay, so it's not objectively wrong then to mutilate and rape a young child. And that brings about all sorts of emotions and, and uh, brings about a, a very pr pristine, robust moral phenomenology. So uh, which theory uh, is going to best explain our moral phenomenology? So we gave three examples, mutilating a raping young child, a father abandoning all of his duties and just walking out the home of his newborn child, uh, and this, this radical uh, Muslim putting an automatic weapon in a two-year-old girl's face. Right? It, 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 what, what theory can sort of best explain our, our, our moral experience that we have when we discuss these situations? Um, you could say something like, well, hey, I'm going to uh, say that there's these sort of non-moral properties that, that sort of just supervene on these, uh, or sorry, that they, you have these moral properties that sort of just supervene on these non-moral properties. You could say that, and you go with this sort of approach. So let's, uh, let's just briefly explain what supervenience yeah. is. So supervenience is more like a dependence? It's a dependence relationship, okay. yeah, uh, between, say, um, A and B. And... Um, Whatever. So, so A and B would one one side of it would be moral properties. Yes. And then the, and the other, other side, side would be natural, natural properties, like yeah. uh, you know the the child is experiencing fear or like uh, physical pain or something like that. Uh, no. Uh, well, I mean, it, so um, it's, it's there's there's a huge debate on what you just it. So I suppose what 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 constitutes here as uh, which which driving the the non moral properties. Um, but there's sort of an emergence that happens. There's there's an emergence uh, at least on some, certain views. That, uh, that there are just these uh, moral values and duties, uh, or perhaps just moral values, depending on uh, who you talk to, um, that, that sort of come about uh, from, from this relationship, that sort of emerges out of this relationship. Uh, so we can call it sort of a platonic uh, moral realism. Uh, so it's platonic insofar as uh, Plato's um, a view that they were abstract objects, um, goodness itself, right? It, 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 they all existed in this, this, this sort of different realm, right? This Platonic heaven. Uh, and so we, we, we don't have to say necessarily they exist in some sort of Platonic realm, some sort of Platonic heaven, but the idea is no, nonetheless the same, that there are these sort of abstract objects or these sort of moral facts that aren't physical. Um, the, 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 these, um, the grounding for these facts um, aren't reducible to physics, uh, but rather you, you, you have these sorts of um, non-moral properties, these, these natural properties, in which these um, uh, moral properties, non-physical uh, properties, non-naturalistic properties emerge. And uh, why is that the case? You know, why not another or something like that? I mean, it's just brute, usually, it's, it's understood. There's no explanation. No explanation. Uh, and so what we're doing, uh, just to just to yeah, back up a yeah, step, yeah. so we're comparing this concept right, yeah. of, of this uh, moral Platonism, yes, uh, non-naturalistic moral Platonism, uh, non-naturalistic in a sense, okay. uh, in a sense there still is no God, <laughs> right. no ghosts, so you know it's 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 still naturalist in, in a broad sense, but yep, yeah, uh, it's it's not naturalism in some sort of hard reductive sense, uh, versus 
right, a more of a theistic divine command ethic. And uh, so let, let's, let's let's take this sort of this 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 Platonic view. Um, I could see how it could ground moral values. I don't know. Um, I could see that like right and wrong could just be properties that emerge. Um, as a, as a result of being in some sort of relationship with these uh, naturalistic properties. Um, but it's really hard for me to conceive how duties can emerge. Uh, it's really hard for me to imagine uh, uh, us having duties without an authority figure in general, but it's especially hard for me to figure out how we can have duties, at least the type of duties which we experience in the scenarios, uh, the aforementioned scenarios, um, by way of just postulating um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the moral values realm. as we yeah, just described a, a few minutes ago. Uh, maybe you, you think that, um, well, if you want to be good, you know, the good sort of emerges in this scenario, and if you want to be good, you have a good reason, you have a duty to, to, to do the good. That might be a duty of some sense, but that's not sort of the duty that we have in these, these moral situations as discussed. Uh, when, we, when we're thinking about the mutilation of a young child, uh, it's, it's a much stronger uh, sense of, of um, duty than just having reasons to, to do the good or something like that. So what do you, what do you mean by that when we, you say that we have a, a, a more, more stronger sense of, so there's of this, duty? There's this sort of um, external bindingness, this sort of external binding sensation that we have when we reflect on, our, on why you ought not to just leave your... A two-year-old child and and just walk out of the house uh, to, for your two-year-old child to die. Um, that we, that that's like there's something external to you, to me, to our society uh, that's binding on us, that's obligating us not to do these things, uh, not not to do these morally abhorrent uh, things. And so I just it's just I find I'm I'm very dissatisfied whenever I hear these sorts of naturalistic, realistic attempts to explain this aspect of our moral phenomenology. It just seems better explained. I'm not saying it can't even explain it. I'm open to it still being able to sort of have the explanatory sc scope to explain it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a less satisfying, I think, explanation. Okay. So one of the distinctions I think that would be uh, helpful to make here is the distinction between moral values mm -hmm. and then moral duties. That's right. On the other hand. And so what you're saying, it seems to be that there's Sure, we can ground moral uh, moral values mm -hmm. in this Platonic realm. Maybe, That's right. But it doesn't seem that we can actually go further with the duties. That's right. So the moral duties that we have, the obligations that we have. And so um, let's just talk about that distinction a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then maybe explain it just a little bit, just one more time. Sure. So uh, you can have a, a moral value. So say maybe that there's some sort of value that like um, it's bad to um, eat your children. Or it's good to be a lifeguard to or save walk old ladies or... across the street or something like that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, well, that's, that's it's great. You can tell me that something is is inherently good or something's in inherently uh, bad, but that doesn't say anything about okay. Now we actually have a duty upon us to do that good thing or to not do that bad thing. And so, and, for instance, and this is just one example. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't have an obligation to become a lifeguard mm -hmm. because becoming a lifeguard is good mm -hmm. or, or even a, if you want to think right. about it like a doctor so it's good to become a doctor but you don't have an obligation a moral obligation yeah to become a moral doctor. values are insufficient to uh, bring about a moral duty in and of themselves that's right and so on, on this sort of divine command theory ethics God is what grounds our, our, our moral duties uh, so I, I personally take the view that uh, for simplicity's sake, that goodness is grounded in the very essence, the, the character of God, and that his duties ground, our, his commands ground our duties. Uh, but I'm saying even if you want to go some sort of more platonic route to ground the good, I still think you're going to need God, uh, because uh, when we're trying to explain this sort of external binding sensation that we have and, and within our moral phenomenology, especially with the aforementioned uh, scenarios, uh, I'm much more satisfied when I hear the theistic explanation than I am with any sort of platonic, uh, naturalistic explanation. And so why, why isn't the, uh, the platonic explanation, why isn't that satisfactory in explaining this, this sort of external binding yeah. force, the sensation that, that you, uh, you're saying that we have? So why, why is the platonic version of it not mm -hmm. 
not as good. Why can't you just say that, you know, maybe it's another brute fact since we're already postulating that yeah. these, these moral facts are brute and, and they supervene and that's... That's just not satisfying. <laughs> I mean, even when it says possible, right? Uh, just we have moral duties and it's just brute. Uh, I mean, sure, you can say that, but I'm just much more, uh, my, my intuitions are, are much more sympathetic and uh, are much more attracted to uh, something that has a better sort of explanatory story. Uh, so maybe, maybe you think, well, hey, this sort of just gives me a slight preference to prefer theism over, over atheism or something like that. Maybe, uh, maybe you have shown that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, theism is sort of a better uh, explanation for our moral experience rather than naturalism. But you haven't done it in, 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 such, a, in such a way as to... Um, uh, move me, maybe move, to move me. Let me reject theism now, right. or reject atheism now, and embrace theism. Well, then I would say, well, there are other arguments you should consider too. Um, there's actually another version of the moral argument that's quite relevant to the evolutionary argument against naturalism. We talked about um, how evolution uh, and naturalism maybe would give us defeater for doing science or um, high-level metaphysics or something like that. I think that's sort of the the way that Linville, right, in the in the Blackwell, yeah, uh, companions of natural theology, yeah, yeah, he goes about it slightly different, but nonetheless in the same sort of way, where uh, he, he, there's these things called Darwinian counterfactuals, where um, if I would have evolved in a slightly different way, I would have believed uh, I would have I would have a different moral belief, right, and so he argues, what are the chances out of all the ways we could have evolved? that we actually have evolved in such a way as to have reliable moral beliefs. It seems quite low. Minimally, you need to be, you need to think the probability is, is inscrutable, unknowable, right? And, you, and thus, you have a defeater. Um, and then you can actually turn that into an, a positive argument f uh, against naturalism and say, well, if naturalism entails a defeater for moral ethical beliefs, um, uh, and, and thus makes these sort of moral beliefs uh, unwarranted or un, un, uh, we can't have knowledge of them. But I do have knowledge that it's wrong to mutilate and rape a young child. That it is morally abhorrent just to walk out on your two-year-old. Uh, that it is uh, abhorrent to uh, put a, a, an automatic weapon in a two-year-old girl's face. Uh, I do have knowledge of these things. Um, so, naturalism is false. Yeah. Right? And that's a, that would be a, a valid argument. It would mm -hmm. be a completely Yeah, depending on how argument. you make sure to have the premises right. But yeah, right. that's right. Um, and so let's move on to, uh, well, first thing, I, I want to do uh, cover two things. But first, let's talk about how theism mm -hmm. um, is, is a better explanation mm -hmm. of these facts. And so why does why is theism so satisfactory mm -hmm. in explaining, you know, moral uh, duties? John Locke thought that there's just, you know, this is sort of, it was a natural law. Uh, that uh, if you create something, you have ownership of it. God creates us, and he has a, his ownership over us, and that's our sort of duty stem from from him. So he 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 goes a uh, uh, around uh, answering this question by way of utilizing his view of natural law theory. So okay, that's that's pretty interesting. Um, let's move on to this uh, to an objection, the, okay. probably the most popular okay. objection that you hear. Yeah. To uh, to theistic ethics. Okay. Or to theistically grounded ethics. So mm -hmm. it, it's the Euthyphro dilemma. Sure. Um, sure. And we've all pretty much, if, you, if you're familiar with natural theology at all or the moral argument, sure. you're bound to have heard this term pop up. So so what is the the Euthyphro dilemma? Mm -hmm. um, and then what's your general response to it? Yeah. Uh, so the Euthyphro dilemma, is something like. Um, it comes from a dialogue, Euthyphro, where um, Socrates is trying to understand what is piety, what is pious, in other, term, in other words, what is, what is goodness, right? And he asks Euthyphro, right? And so this, he, he formulates this dilemma for Euthyphro that either uh, God determines, uh, he sort of wills what's good, or something is good just sort of intrinsically, and God supports it because it's just good intrinsically, right? And... Um, uh, there's sort of bo bo both of these options have negative consequences for the theist. The first option seems to make morality arbitrary, where it's possible that God could have willed that rape, mutilation, pillaging, and so forth would would have been good. Well, if God's will determines what is good, then why couldn't it be possible that these really morally abhorrent things that we seem to modally at least think are impossible to be good could be good, right? So that's, that's, that's sort of a negative feature of this horn. So then the theist may be inclined to go to the second option and think, well, 
God doesn't will what uh, God's will doesn't determine what's good. It's just good because it's good, and God just endorses what's good because He's a good God. He's a good guy. Um, well, one, you haven't really defined what what goodness is still, and secondly, you sort of make God irrelevant insofar as um, grounding. Um, goodness, grounding our moral values and duties. And a theist who's postulating the moral argument in this context, uh, that wouldn't be a, a, a sort of a good, a good route for him to go. So there's this sort of dilemma. Uh, well, so do you? So is your response to uh, reject the dilemma as a false dilemma? Yes. Or do you uh, accept one of the, the horns or so? Sure. No, I do reject it as a false dilemma. Uh, I think there's actually two responses. One, you just call it straight up false dilemma. Um, one, um, you focus more, a little bit more on the negative consequence of the second horn. Um, so, uh, in the first one, so as uh, Adams and Craig uh, have, have argued, uh, I think persuasively, that um, uh, good, goodness, is grounded in the very nature of God. The immutable, never-changing nature of God. Uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's God's essence. That's what, what uh, where goodness is grounded in. God's character is the very paradigm of goodness, and which doesn't change. Um, it's impossible to change, so, so modally you can't have these crazy situations, nor does it seem arbitrary, that because uh, it's not based on God's will, but rather God's, God's nature. Uh, and so um, that's one sort of approach to go, that our moral values are grounded in the very nature of God, in a non-arbitrary and a way, in a way in which it's impossible to be otherwise. There's another sort of approach where you can think that maybe God's nature doesn't ground goodness. Um, maybe goodness is grounded in a platonic sense, sort of, as mentioned earlier. But still, that doesn't make God irrelevant, uh, for a moral argument at least, um, because moral duties still need to be grounded. And maybe you're persuasive, you think it's persuasive to think that God's the best explanation of moral duty. So you still need to postulate God, not to explain those moral values, but to explain those moral duties. So God is still um, uh, uh, quite relevant, even if you ground goodness in something else. So do you think that a euthyphro dilemma could be uh, formulated against the, uh, the moral duties? So in, in that sense, instead of, instead of focusing on the good, mm -hmm. um, maybe we could focus on, on moral duties. Mm -hmm. Either God has reasons for commanding as he does, uh, or um, these reasons you know, sort of determine what God, what God wills. Yeah, um, well, without God's uh, uh, giving us duties, I mean, you would still have things that are good or things that are bad. Um, that's, that's, that's not in question here. So it's not as if God could have just, at his whim, sort of give another duty, right? Uh, but nonetheless, I think it really is important to try to capture our moral experience. And in our moral experience, we do perceive du that we have duties. Um, and so it seems to me that God's best explanation of that. Uh, yeah, so I guess I don't feel the, the tension of sort of the possibility that God, our duties could be arbitrary um, if indeed uh, God is good and he's being good, can endorse a good thing. So it doesn't seem like that our duties could be arbitrary. But nonetheless, uh, it seems like God's quite relevant because even if, cause, cause if God didn't exist, then we, we, we wouldn't have, we might not have these, these duties that we experience. So on that point, I think that the same response that you already gave yeah. would apply to this new version okay. that was uh, that was specifically on these moral obligations. You okay. would say it's a still a false dilemma uh -huh. um, because God can have reasons to command what he does, but those reasons aren't sufficient mm -hmm. for constituting these that's moral right. obligations that we have. That's right. Um, and so I think that's the, the, the better, or not not necessarily the better, but the, the response you already gave yeah, no, no, was, that's right, that's uh, right. was already sufficient there. And, and then you just go back into the reasons why mm -hmm. you know God is, is necessary to ground these moral sure. obligations beyond just the reasons that he might have, uh, or the goodness, you know, the, yeah. grounded in either God's nature or in some platonic sense of the good. Sure. Um, my finger just cracked there for the for the audio, but um, so yeah, I think that's the the basic response. Okay. It, yeah. It, it seems no, that, to me that that's, that's the same. That's yeah. That, that's what I was uh, articulating. That um, uh, it's insufficient merely to have reasons. Uh, you you still need this sort of authority figure that's able to give you something binding that's external to yourself. Um, so re re reasons uh, alone to to do something that's good because you want to do something that's good or. Uh, because that's just the creature you are, or something like that, uh, it would seem to be insufficient. You still need to postulate this transcendent authority figure. That's right.